Japan being woken up by a siren on Tuesday morning as a North Korean missile flew over the country. The rocket was launched from near Pyongyang and it flew over the northern island of Hokkaido before splitting into three parts and landing into the sea to the east. It's just the latest in a series of military missile tests conducted by North Korea this year, but a more serious one because it flew over Japan. The last time that happened was nearly two decades ago. Their outrageous act of firing a missile over our country is an unprecedented, serious and grave threat, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said. At a U.S. base near Tokyo, a military drill was conducted by Japanese forces in response to the missile launch. Across the sea in South Korea, joint exercises are underway with American troops. They are held every August and North Korea usually responds with a show of strength. Last year, it conducted a nuclear test in retaliation. This year, it's flown a missile that had the potential to cause serious harm. A strong message that despite international pressure, Pyongyang has no intention to stop. Yogut Alamai, BBC News, Seoul. Here to the sound of air raid sirens and being told to find shelter in concrete buildings or basements is not a normal occurrence. Uh, for people in Japan. In fact, as far as I'm aware, I think this is the first time this has happened perhaps since the Second World War. People have been practicing the last few months in towns up and down the coast of Japan because of the increased uh, number of missile tests by North Korea. But this is the first time that it's happened for real. That you know, The public address system is being used to tell people there's a missile flying in our direction, find shelter. So this is a very serious and very aggressive thing for North Korea to do. Countries do not normally fire ballistic missiles across the territory of their neighbors. And that's why we've seen this very angry uh, response from the Japanese government, from Prime Minister Abe, calling this an act of violence, saying it's unprecedented, uh, and uh, speaking to President Trump and them together, saying they will now take this to the UN Security Council and demand action from, you know, the world community, especially at the moment of the missile program. But China also says that the UN resolutions, apart from calling for sanctions, also call for all parties to move towards peace talks and it's questioned rhetorically whether or not everybody and it means by this the US and South Korea whether everybody is really heading towards these peace talks. Can China bring any more influence to bear do you think on North Korea and what it does next? I think there's no doubt that China can pile more pressure on North Korea. I mean it is the biggest. North Korea, Japan, and the United States will not say that. Nobody wants to actually sort of formally put that in print. But, you know, North Korea is here now with a nuclear missile, and there's really not a whole lot we can do about it. Um, and I think that probably gives them a certain amount of confidence they can get away with more stuff. Also, the North Koreans like to provoke during um, the American South Korean drills and exercises. There's a big one going on right now. It's called Old Chief Freedom Guardian, and this is all about interoperability and scenarios for conflict with North Korea. The North Koreans claim that these are rehearsals for invasion. They're not. But the North Koreans like to you know, sort of respond in some way. And missile tests have sort of been one of their favorites. So this is something we kind of expect. Not this particular thing, shooting over the islands, but something is pretty typical. So do you think that sanctions just aren't working? No, actually, I don't. And I, th I think the sanctions sort of get an unfair rap on this. Um, I think the proper counterfactual for sanctions is not, well, they shouldn't have a nuclear program at all because the sanctions work well. It's rather how much worse would the nuclear program be if we didn't have sanctions? That is to say, you know, you hear people kick around that they might have 50 or 60 warheads now, or maybe they'd have 200 if we didn't have the sanctions. So I would argue that the sanctions stay in place. We need to start going after North Korean money, particularly North Korean money and Chinese banks. That's the big, I think that's sort of the big goal out there. Um, but no, we, we shouldn't let up and we should keep going back to the UN Security Council. I mean, there's really no good kinetic options, right? Talking to North Korea is probably not going to work. We should try that too. I don't really see much choice, but they continue to do what we're doing, which is the UN and missile defense. Okay, so let's explore that a little bit more. What do you think the response is going to be from South Korea, from Japan, which beyond the rhetoric has traditionally, uh, you know, kept a relatively low profile on this matter? What right. do you think the response is going to be this time? Yeah, I mean, it's really sort of on Japan now to sort of find some kind of way to respond to this, right? As your correspondents previously pointed out, North Korea has only done this twice before. Um, this time it really was sort of obviously a ballistic missile, the, the previous ones were too. But this really is about terrorizing Japanese civilians, and it's hard to be a serious government without some kind of response. If I had to guess in Japan, this will really improve the positions of hawks in Japan who want missile defense. 
Um, Japan does not have, for example, that battery, the terminal high altitude area defense battery, which now exists in South Korea to protect against these kinds of strikes. I would imagine there'll be pressure in Japan to get that too. Um, in general, I think this is sort of the strategic race in Asia you'll see in the next decade or so with North Korea. As the North Koreans build more missiles, there's going to be an increasing amount of pressure for missile defense, and so you're going to kind of you'll get a kind of arms race around that. And in terms of resuming any sort of talks over North Korea's nuclear weapons program, what of that route does that stand stand any chance of of, of any success? Yeah, probably not. Um, the North Koreans have put a huge amount of money into getting a nuclear weapon. North Korea's GDP is only about 35 to 40 billion dollars, um, considering, uh, depending what statistic you take, right? That's really not a lot of money for a program this complicated. I've heard numbers thrown around as high as 8% of GDP has gone into this program. So they're not going to give it up without some massive concession. And it's just not one the United States is going to give. The United States is not going to unilaterally pull out of North and South Korea or something like that. Right. So the talks probably won't really go very far. We should keep trying. Maybe we can get some small concessions. We may make small changes. But, you know, we've been talking to the North Koreans about their nuclear program since the early 1990s. And it's always been sort of two steps forward, then one to the right and three back and the rest of it. And it's kind of never really gone anywhere. We should keep trying, but we should be very skeptical that there's some big, you know, so, some grand agreement at the end of this. OK, Professor Kelly, thank you very much for your time today. Professor Robert Kelly, uh, professor of political science at Busan National University in South Korea.